I like the idea of merging experimentalists uh, more with theory. And so I, I you know, spent some work shifting the focus of my normal talk, which I think to try to make it uh, more approachable by, uh, by, by, by theorists. I hope I did a good job. Um, so I am speaking on behalf of the Neutron EDM collaboration at, at the Spallation Neutron Source Collaboration, which is in, uh, based at uh, Oak Ridge National Lab at Tennessee. But you see we, we're from all over the uh, North America, actually. Um, and the, the focus of my talk is I'm, I'm going to, since I'm the first up uh, in the first up experimental talk, I want to give a brief overview of the experimental techniques we use uh, in Neutron EDM experiments. Uh, and then I think that will help appreciate why I'm calling our approach rather novel. Okay, so it's going to be quite different than the other schemes that you're going to hear about later on in this uh, uh, workshop. And I'm going to talk about some other physics reach as well um, uh, uh, that we can use with this uh, apparatus. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm recently relocated to a university not too far from Manhattan. So for the experimental side, you know, how, how, how why we're sitting here today practically is, you know, how it all started. So back in uh, 1950, uh, this is in the local newspaper of Oak, Oak Ridge, Tennessee. And you know, you've made it big when you make the local newspaper and it calls your research important. Okay. Uh, there's two names here you might recognize, Purcell and Ramsey. Okay, who performed, this is the grad student. Uh, at the first uh, uh, pile that was successful, X10 pile in Oak Ridge, Tennessee. And this is, you know, remarkable. You don't, this does not happen now, but you know, this, this, this pile obviously was motivated by other uh, research, let's say. Um, and uh, it went critical in 1943. And then you had first kind of civilian experiments already in 1945, okay? Again, this is not, not common these days. Uh, and so what happened, the story I hear is that they, they, they went out, I guess, to, to find a project for a graduate student, performed the experiment in 1950. Uh, and then a famous result for parity violation came in in 1957, okay? So they, they, they sat on this result for about seven years and they realized, oh man, you know, maybe we can publish something about time reversal symmetry violation. Normally you try to publish a bit faster if you want a you know, career. Uh, and so then only in 1957, they published a result which sets the limit on the neutron EDM at kind of 10 to the minus 20, uh, the modern units is electron centimeters, okay? So 10 to the minus 20, you keep that in mind. And so since then, since the 1957 result, this is the landscape that we've, the field has uh, come towards. Um, if you plot the limit of the neutron EDM, obviously we haven't discovered it yet, uh, versus the time. So here you have the 1957 result. Uh, and then you see the gradual decrease of the sense, uh, improvement in the sensitivity over, I think that's about seven orders or eight orders of magnitude, which is rather impressive. This culminated in a, a, a result here from my colleague down here, um, Philip schmidt wielenberg's group, where they got a two times 10 to minus 26 E centimeter result published uh, a few years ago. Uh, the, 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 Future take in the field is we want to go towards this beam, uh, kind of straight down here. You see, it's kind of saturating, and it's it's been hard progress, right? Uh, even though this is a log plot, it's been hard progress, and so uh, the future you're going to hear quite a few different experiments that are sitting in this ten to the minus twenty seven e centimeters sensitivity. The experiment I'm going to talk to you about that we're trying to do is trying to get down to this ten to the minus twenty eight e centimeter region. Uh, one thing you note from this plot is, you know, early on, uh, there are a lot of experiments done with neutron beams, okay, uh, starting around the late 70s, I call this kind of a phase transition or technique transition, all the, all the measurements now use what's called ultra cold neutrons, okay, I'll, I'll describe more about that uh, in the next couple of slides, and the landscape well, except for one experiment, which you also hear about, which still use, which was trying to revive the beam technique. But the rest you see, you know, these are the different experiments. They all, they all use ultra cold neutrons. They all use the Ramsey technique, which I also briefly review, uh, double cell. And there's also, you hear, you see another word, co-magnetometer everywhere, okay? And you see that our one is the one that has a lot of different words, okay? So I'm gonna describe what those different words mean. So, 
as you can tell from you know the name Purcell, who you know a Nobel Prize for nu nuclear magnetic resonance, that this fundamentally we're doing a nuclear resonance experiment. Okay, uh, and why is that? If I put the energy or the Hamiltonian of a particle with a magnetic moment, a magnetic dipole moment, and electric dipole moment, okay, I put in some you know common magnetic field values for Earth's magnetic field. I get an energy of about 10 to the minus 13 electron volts. I take this limit from the, the first limit uh, of the EDM, multiply it by the strongest electric field we can produce in the lab, okay? Uh, then I already get 10 to the minus 15 e uh, 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 electron volts, which is already two orders of magnitude smaller than the magnetic field. So of course, this one now is another six orders of magnitude lower. And so you see the, the interaction or the technique is we always have to deal or precisely control the magnetic moment or magnetic fields in order to have any information on the electric dipole moment search. So that's, so the, so that's the common technique on all the uh, magnetism control. So a maxim that us, uh, experimentalists always use for precision experiments is always measure frequency. I probably spent too much time in, on the internet to try to figure out who said that. It's lost to history. I've heard, it's surely not uh, Weeman because he's too young, but it may, may go back to Robbie and Ramsey. And, you know, the idea is, you know, why always measure frequency if you want high precision? Uh, one, of the, one of the first points is uh, time or clocks can be controlled and measured very, to a very high precision these days. So I was walking downtown yesterday and I saw this nice old clock tower uh, down in uh, Trento. And so we came from that to this. This is a photo I took of my bathroom clock that I think I paid $15 on Amazon for. And if I press a button, I get atomic time, okay? Presumably through some uh, radio signal and I'm synchronized to some atomic clock, okay? So just from you know, my $15 clock, I have very accurate time information, okay? Uh, the other you know, reason why we wanna measure frequency is when you, if you have some signal that varies with time, uh, you, only, you, only care, you don't care about the absolute size of the signal. If you, know, if you measure experimental physics, absolute signals are hard. In this case, you only care about some relative change in the signal and you're looking for essentially a zero crossing, okay? Or the crossing, uh, crossing some, some average value. The other thing is when you're doing, oh, similar to the previous point is that when you, um, measuring frequencies, any drifts in the signal detection amplitude on time scales, which are longer than a few oscillations, would not affect your frequency measurement, okay? So this is some dummy picture where, uh, you know, the true signal is in blue, and this orange or red is some signal which is drifting in, in amplitude, and even the offset is drifting with time. You see, even by eye, the frequency does not change so much. I can see the clear cycles, and I can fit for it, okay? So that's an, another key advantage of frequency. So now I want to describe the traditional technique, which is you know or the Ramsey technique that a lot of people use. It's the full name is the Ramsey's technique of separated oscillatory fields, just to you know merge our language that we uh, you know we, we tend to have a lot of jargon or or uh, simplified pictures as experimentalists. So when you know when you hear me talk about the spin vector, well I'm referring to some net spin vector which is the macroscopic uh, spin polarization of neutrons or of, of some atomic species, which obeys Bloch's NMI equations, okay? You can lose, some people do go into more details with uh, density matrices and, 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 and the Bloch sphere representation. If you do need to go to that, but kind of everyday parlance or uh, talk, we just talk about some spin vector, okay? With some polarization. Uh, so in this technique, uh, what you do is you have some clock that's ticking uh, in your hardware uh, at, at a frequency close to the Lamor uh, frequency of the system. In fact, it's not quite, but it's close to the Lamor frequency. You have some, you set up some static uh, field, B0 field, magnetic field. You start with your neutrons polarized to this field, okay, aligned with this field. Then uh, this is, you know, what's called pulse NMR essentially. You apply some AC field, which is at the Lamor or close to the Lamor frequency, uh, which is transverse to the B naught field. Okay, and this you can do the rotating wave approximation and all that. You then you can tip the spins into what's called the transverse plane. 
spin of the neutrons. Then you turn off your AC field and your neutron will spin will start to precess at the Lamour frequency, okay? Uh, the, the, the new, the, the separated oscillatory field is that at a later time, synchronized to the same clock, so you, you pull your signal from the same clock, you apply a second pi over two pulse, okay? In this case, if the neutron ended up, spin ended up here, you do another pi over two, and you end up with a purely spin down system relative to the B naught field, okay? And then, you know, then, then you perform some spin analysis along B naught, you count the numbers of neutrons that are spin down, say, uh, some of the modern experiments, you actually count both spin up and spin down after the spin analysis and gives you more better normalization handles. But essentially you count, yeah, the number of neutrons in one spin state. And what you're doing with this technique is you're actually measuring the final phase of the neutron at the stage, just before you apply the, the second pi over two pulse, okay? Uh, of course, then if you divide the final phase, the, the total accumulated phase with this total precession time, you get something like an average precession frequency, okay? Uh, so you do this with the electric field parallel to B naught, and you get some precession frequency, which is the Lamour. And if there is a non-zero neutron EDM, you get some additional uh, frequency shift, okay? Proportion to the electric field, as you can imagine, and, and, uh, and, and, and neutron EDM. You repeat the same experiment, same procedure, but now you flip the E field relative to the B field. And then the sign of your shift now goes the other way due to the EDM, okay? And then of course, if there is a frequency shift uh, with the E field downwards, what happens now is that your precession, your neutron spin might not, will not end up being here, but say it's end up being slightly lagged or further back, okay? So the, the final phase is different. And then now if you apply this pi over two pulse, you end up rotating the spin, in this case, to, to more spin up state, okay? And so now you get, you know, you still get some in the spin down, some fraction in the spin down when you do analysis along B naught, but now you get more in the spin up. And so in this case, if the neutron EDM is non-zero, then your differences in the spin down, the, the number that you count at the end is non-zero, okay? I argue that this is not a frequency measurement as you know, often people think it is, okay? Well, why is that? So for one, you know, well, let's, let's, let's go this way. So in this final spin analysis, I normally have some counting, some detectors counting neutrons. If there is any efficiency changes in your detection, uh, you know, and typically each of these separate uh, repeats happens over, takes about hundred seconds to prepare and do this whole thing, okay? And so you can get a lot of drifts over 100 seconds. Any drifts in, the, in your detection efficiency directly shifts your deduced average frequency, okay? That didn't sound like what I, the point I made earlier, okay? And the other thing is, you know, if I ask someone doing this technique, tell me what the precession frequency at any time during this free precession, which is again, over 100 seconds, they would not be able to tell me, right? Or they can tell me some average final average precession frequency. So, and for due to numerous, numerous reason, reasons, this is not a constant value, okay? Uh, the, the, you, you see that, you know, the, the, the bane of the experiment is we always get drifts or sh uh, jumps in B naught that we have to correct for. So I'm gonna try to go through and quickly in one slide, what ultra cold neutrons are. So we you know, have a lot of uh, nuclear physicists here. Uh, typically when you have slow neutrons, they undergo scattering from a, a strong force scattering from, a, from nuclei. Um, our energies are so low, it's always S wave scattering, okay? When our cold neutron scatters off a whole of material, you know, collection of nuclei, uh, you know, we have to, you know, we'll write out the outgoing wave function as an integral of all the scattering centers. If you apply a Born approximation to this, where you treat each nuclei as a delta function, okay, you essentially get uh, what's called the neutron optical potential or effective neutron optical potential, which is given by essentially the nuclei number density in your material times the bound coherent scattering length, okay. And you sum over all the different species in a, in a material. Uh, and the typical, if you go through and calculate the effective neutron optical potential, you have some materials which are in the 300 nano electron volts. Okay, so it's a potential energy. 
And you actually get some which are negative, okay? Uh, I bring up uh, deuterated polystyrene. This is a plastic, which is commonly used in our field for reflecting neutrons or ultra cold neutrons, has a potential of 116 nano electron volts. So that's the kind of kinetic energy of UCNs that you can store. Well, oh, sorry, I jumped ahead. So it was realized in the 1950s, kind of Fermi and different groups around uh, Europe, that if a neutron had an energy below this uh, optical potential of material, then you can get reflection, at, or what I call it total external reflection at all incident angles, okay? And so which means that, you know, if you put a neutron in a bottle with sufficiently low energy, you can just store it in the bottle through these uh, reflections off material walls. And if you go through, you see the wavelength, kinetic energy is less than this 300 nano electron volts. The wavelength is around 60 nanometers, and I should say why in a second. Velocity is around seven meters per second. So on a good day, maybe still, I could probably run that, that speed, okay, for a short time. And the temperature, I put it in quotation marks because it's not actually in thermal equilibrium with anything. But the temperature, if you, you know, is approximately two millikelvin if you do your E equals KBT. And um, what might be interesting is, well, you know, there's no coincidence that this phenomena of re reflection starts happening at 60 nanometers, which is around the wavelength of optical light, right? And there's a reason why this is called optical potential, because for every one atom that light scatters off, there's one nuclei that neutrons scatter off, okay? So the density, the scale of, or the density of scattering centers is the same in the two cases. That's why you have the same wavelength. Um, in this first of the storage neutrons, the, the process is not perfect. I won't go through the details why, and it's more experimental anyway, but the typical loss probability per reflection is around 10 to the minus four. Uh, uh, and some materials that we're developing is reaching the 10 to the minus five region. So, you know, that's Dawson for longer. And uh, the reflection rate of materials is given by, you know, some kinetic theory, okay? Velocity times the area of your walls divided by volume. So typically you also have beta decay loss, which, you know, the mean lifetime is 880 seconds. So if you combine the two losses, you can store uh, ultra cold neutrons to, for about 100 to 600 seconds of uh, lost time total. Okay, so the, the kind of traditional experiments with uh, neutron EDM is, uh, you know, with the Ramsey technique is you, you have a cell, which we call the Ramsey cell. You put in your B field, I'm just drawing, I'm drawing it vertically. Your electric field then of course has to be parallel or anti-parallel to the B field. You come in from ex with external source of ultra cold neutrons, you put it into the cell, you do your pi over two pulses and all that. Uh, and, then, uh, and then you typically empty the cell. Okay, so you have, you have a valve there, you store on the UC ultra cold neutrons, you open the valve and then you, you, you switch them down into some spin analyzer, okay? So this is typically some, it's kind of like a stern gerlach experiment where you're trying to separate the two spin states in space and you count, you count the spin state. The pure spin state. Uh, you normally have, you see a lot of magnetic shielding, um, yeah, to control your magnetic fields. Another key point you see in these experiments is you have ultra cold neutrons, but in the same volume, what you put is a co magnetometer, okay? Because what you really want to do is know the magnetic field that the neutrons experience uh, uh, in the same volume. So, this, you know, most modern experiments, you employ a co, uh, co magnetometer. Um, and the, the technology to this is you need, you know, sufficiently high a number of co-magnetometer atoms. So you have some precision in measuring the field. Okay. Uh, but you can't have it too high. Otherwise you get electrical breakdowns. If you have a gap, you have a strong electric field. If you have some poor vacuum, you get breakdowns. And if you have too high of the co-magnetometer species that you can also get used to ultra cold neutron loss, which is what you don't want. And so this is a landscape picture of the co-magnetometry um, co magnetometry landscape from, from this review of modern physics paper. Uh, you, you know, you're trading off, well, there's a correlation between sensitivity and accuracy. Okay, and this is from one of the early results uh, on the neutron EDM. And you see in the, in the blue dots, okay, you see this is the raw neutron frequency or the magnetic field experienced by the neutrons. You see it, it jumps around. Uh, however, when you apply correction with the co-magnetometer, all of a sudden you get this flat uh, frequency, which is what you want, right? You don't care about 
you know, drifts in the magnetic field, which is what you're trying to suppress. Uh, so ultimately, a neutron EDM experiment is you're actually measuring the neutron EDM size relative to the co magnetometer's EDM, okay? Then, uh, uh, fortunately, in the co magnetometer EDMs, you normally it's in some atom with electron cloud and you, you get some relativistic shift suppression. So any electric field uh, chain, uh, uh, suppresses the effect of the co magnetometer's EDM. Um, however, in, the two species will still experience a slightly different net magnetic field, even though in, this, in the same volume. So how is that? Uh, this is primarily caused by the differences in the motion, okay? So two species, same volume. The UCNs have such low gravity, uh, sorry, such low velocities or speeds that they sag in gravity, okay? They're moving so slow. On the, at the top, they're moving slower. And so they end up being a few millimeters. The center of mass is a few millimeters below the co-magnetometer. And also, uh, although you think this is typically a small effect, uh, the relativistic E cross V motional field that a moving a particle moving in an electric field experiences are also different, right? Because when uh, UCNs are moving at seven meters per second, five meters per second, and the species is typically moving at 30 to 100 meters per second, okay? Uh, and so actually the main cause of this for the uh, co-magnetometer species is an effect called a false EDM, which we'll uh, briefly go over it later, which is the most serious systematic effect. And another, another thing that we, uh, I'm gonna be focusing on this helium three plus squid uh, co-magnetometry that our experiment uses. So, so that's the traditional technique. So the idea came up a while ago now from Golub uh, and Steve Lamoro is, what if we use helium three, can we use helium three as a co-magnetometer and a spin analyzer or spe specifically a live and in situ UCN spin analyzer. Uh, and so helium three gas, polarized helium three gas is used quite commonly for spin analysis. Uh, and this relies on this very strongly spin dependent capture cross section. Okay, if you have a helium three polarized with a neutron polarized, uh, you produce a proton, triton, and 700 keV of energy. Uh, However, uh, when the two spin states are anti-parallel, you have enormous cross-section for this reaction. If they're parallel, the, this is actually an upper limit, is you know, essentially zero, okay? So then the, if you put the two species together, polarize, then the reaction rate uh, or the capture rate, it depends, equals the number of UCNs times some uh, rate function of one over time constant, which is given by the density of helium three atoms and some cross-sections. So the main thing is it depends on the polarization of the two species and the angle between the spins. Okay, so if I have helium three and neutrons, I normally have some angle between them, and that gives you the absorption of neutron helium three capture rate. So then experimental detail, if I detect the 700 keV, which is pretty easy for experimentalists, let's say, then what I have is an in situ, as in the same place as the ultra cold neutrons, uh, spin analysis and it's live if I can if I can keep counting this ca uh, these capture rates. So to optimize this, you know, we want the helium three neutron capture rate to be similar to the UCN lost time in a cell. So we want this to 500 seconds, which is this quantity here. What that means is I want a nuclear helium three density in space of about 10 to the 12, okay, and with close to near 100% polarization. So can this be achieved? Yes, it turns out, you know, uh, if you go to these neutron beam spin analyzers, they don't get to 100%, they get closer to like 70, 80% polarization. But luckily with uh, the atomic beam source from the AMO field, they can get close to 100%, but the trade-off being you can't get a very high density, which but it turns out it satisfies the number or density that we need for the helium three. Um, the other requirement, if you want to use this as a co-magnetometer, is this: you want this uh, helium three density produce produce magnetic fields that you can also detect. And it turns out, if you put in ten to the ten to the twelve per centimeter cube, you get femto Tesla fields, which sounds really small, but this is actually routinely detectable by superconducting quantum interference devices, okay, which work in cryogenic temperatures. But uh, this is a kind of routine technique. So our collaboration is trying to use this new scheme, uh, combining ultra cold neutrons, helium three, and we're going to talk. I'm going to talk a bit about superfluid helium four, 
uh, uh, plays a key role in this as well. And so we have a lot of different, about 22 different universities and national lab uh, are working on this. And this is, so actually this talk breaks it nicely into kind of three pausing points. So if there's any questions, uh, you know, for, for a couple of minutes and gives me- Regarding some. the statistics you have to deal with, um, maybe if you go to uh, slide five, so mm -hmm. you're uh, measuring these uh, differences in the outcome of polarization. So you're counting the neutrons with uh, the respective polarizations at the outcome of the experiment. So, I mean, given the current state of the art, um, how many neutrons are you dealing with? And um, like, how big are the differences in numbers of these polarizations that you are like trying to go after in order to improve the current bounds? I do have a slide on the statistics in a little bit, but I can give you now the, the typical numbers you're counting in the next generation experiments, about 100,000. Is that right? And the difference, ooh, I don't know the difference between spin up and spin down. Well, the bound polarization is up to 80%. So then you have a oh, yeah. difference of 180,000 to 70,000 or 90,000 to uh, but then the, what about the shift in numbers between uh, when you change the E-field? That's essentially zero, right? Yeah, but, and so what are you aiming for in order to improve the bounds? So in this... That's, that's the, the, the next generation. Right. So, you know, the difference when you flip the E-field is essentially zero. So typically these experiments run over many years okay. each. Yeah. And then you, you do an average, you know, this is... Every cycle takes 100 seconds. Imagine doing this 24 7 for three years. Okay. Yeah, maybe it's important to understand that in one cycle. Oh, yeah. yeah. So, so, what Ken was referring to that's one single cycle, one measurement of, a, of about 300 seconds. But typically, you repeat that over years, every day to 200 times. So, in the end, you have, I don't know how many millions. Yeah, that's the total total number you count. And then of course you do the Poisson statistics, put in the systematics, but that, yeah, it's a very small number difference, okay? Yeah. Like I think in the data blinding paper, I think you guys move around five or 10 or something on the order of that. Two, oh, two, okay. That's all you need, right. If you need to have maybe the both measurements, you need to have the same two again. Ah, yes, same strength, but opposite. Yes, that's right, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. that, that's correct. Okay, good question. Thank you. Gave me a little break. Okay, so so I'm going to go over overview of our experiment now. So I told you superfluid helium four plays an essential role. So the it plays many roles actually. You know, one of the first roles it plays is it produces the ultra cold neutrons in the cell. So what happens is we can come in with a cold neutron beam. Uh, this is the famous dispersion relation of superfluid helium. A four uh, from uh, Feynman and Cohen, I believe. And if you plot here, the this is what we call the free neutron dispersion. Okay, so this is just the curve. It's a quadratic relating the energy with the uh, uh, momentum of the neutron. Then you see the two curves as a crossing point around one milli electron volts. Okay, what that means is if I come in with a one milli electron volt cold neutron, not not ultra cold. And I scatter off a phonon uh, in the in the fluid in the superfluid. I can essentially lose all the energy of the cold neutron and come close to the ultra cold neutron energy range. Okay. Uh, it turns out, you know, once it's in this ultra cold neutron state, uh, you, you, of course, you have the inverse process or upscattering, so they gain energy again. It turns out this inverse of this single phonon is not the dominant. If you go through the phase space arguments, uh, you get this two phonon process. A kind of phonon coming in, you get an internal phonon and the UCN, then can upscatter it to become a very cold neutron, which is, you know, on the order of uh, micro tens of micro electron volts. Uh, then this is the dominant upscattering process, but the time constant of this is very strongly temperature dependent, depends on temperature to the seventh power. Okay. Uh, we call this the super, super thermal process because the UCNs, although it's sitting in this dense uh, medium, uh, it's not in thermal equilibrium with the fluid, okay? Uh, for if the fluid at 0 0.4 Kelvin, the upscattering or what we call the thermalization time, okay, to, 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 to get to 0 0.4 Kelvin, which is much too warm for UCNs, 
uh, is around 20 hours. So we actually don't have to worry about it. Okay, so we need to cool our bath to around the point below 0 0.5, 0 0.6 Kelvin, and we're fine. It turns out also that helium-4, if you have isotopically pure helium-4, has the essentially has a perfect zero absorption for neutrons. Okay, so maybe not quite zero, but very low absorption for neutrons that we don't have to worry about. Uh, so, and the other key property we use in the superfluid is, is that it scintillates. Okay, you can, if you have charged particles, you, you choose uh, scintillation light. Unfortunately, well, for experimentalist point of view, this is at 80 nanometers, which is uh, what's called the extreme of vacuum ultraviolet. So it's hard to detect, but we can do it. Um, but if you detect these flashes of light, then you can detect the neutron helium free capture events. Okay. And so if you combine that, you have this uh, 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 spin analysis inside the cell. Uh, another key property, which is very important for systematics, is that the helium three atoms also scatter off phonons in the superfluid. Okay. So uh, I'll go through a little bit later, but the temperature has a very strong effect on the mean free path. And so this is, an, yeah, this, which, which is a very, actually a, a, a good property for us. And so if you look at the scheme of our uh, schematic of our experiment, you see what we have is we have a high voltage electrode in the middle, it's normally in a sandwich setup. Then you have in the two green parts of the ground electrodes. And so you get electric field uh, going to the left on this side, and then your electric field is going to the right on this side. Okay, so now you have opposite electric fields. You bathe this all in a, a constant magnetic field, which is going across left to right in the whole diagram. And so that's that's how you set up a double cell experiment. Okay, so rather than flipping the E field, you can actually kind of you, you have the opposite E and B fields in, in the same time. Okay, which is important for systematic reasons. Uh, you see for our experiment, we have some plumbing where you load in the helium-3 co-magnetometer, and this is some uh, CAD diagram of fibers for picking up the scintillation light. Um, so the, the scheme is we turn on the uh, cold neutron beam, which is going kind of into the page here. You start producing these ultra-cold neutrons in the cell, they, they accumulate. Uh, and then that's how we fill the cell. Okay, so we don't need a valve for filling the cells with, uh, with, with electrical neutrons. And so these measurement cells, you know, we, this is actually something that I lead. We produced, we've been producing these full-size prototype cells for many years now. This is a picture of one illuminated with 30 nanometers, sorry, 300 nanometers UV light, so it fluoresces. Okay, uh, and the size, this is about 40 centimeters long. Okay. And so, and eventually it gets filled with superfluid. So the performance of these cells is, you know, one of the other advantages of having a cryogenic UCN storage is you get lower UCN loss because you suppress upscat, which is the UCNs can also, you know, upscat or thermalize the walls of the container. So if the walls of your container is cooler, you don't get upscattering as much. And so the design goals is to have this, this the walls upscattered with a time constant of 2000 seconds, uh, which corresponds to 600 seconds up uh, total storage time if you combine it with beta decay, okay? So the, the last cells we've been testing at Los Alamos, so that we don't have the final experiment yet, uh, is we're getting 560 seconds plus or minus 20 seconds statistical for, these, uh, for the storage time. So we're very close to the design goal and we're just tweaking to, to get there. Uh, we are, you know, there's some uncertainties due to the ultra cold neutron spectrum. And so we're currently building a new UCN gravitational spectrometer to let us un understand some systematics in these results. So if you go through, you know, the, depending on the flux of your cold neutron beam, you get a polarized UCN density in the cell of around 180 UCNs per centimeter cubed. So if you multiply this by the three, three liters, we have about half a million UCNs at the start of the cell, okay? So that's the that kind of loading of the cell. So the kind of zooming back out, so, sorry, zooming out to the overall schematic of the experiment, what you saw there with the electrodes in the cell sits in what's called, what we call the central detector system. The cold neutron beam comes in, you know, through, through holes from right to left. Uh, what, you, what you need for this experiment, you see it's kind of a building sized kind of experiment. Uh, you need a magnetic field module, which is 
being led by Caltech, reduced the AC fields and the B0 fields that you need. There's a big magnetic shield enclosure, which is made from mu metal for shielding uh, the Earth's magnetic field, but also if any trucks drive past or doers being moved around, you want to suppress that field. So we have a mu metal room. All that helium three for loading and unloading, you have a polarized atomic helium three atomic beam source sitting here. So that gets loaded into the cell through, uh, through so, 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 so from the beam source, it gets accumulated in some volume and through the helium three services, uh, cryostat, which is a dilution refrigerator, uh, we can move or flush or heat flush those helium three atoms into the cell and then flush them out again. Okay, so that's the loading. If there's time, you can ask me at the end, you know, what, what the process is for doing that. Okay, I've gone through. So as I mentioned, there's a you know, quick slide on statistics. So if you, this is a good exercise for students that I said, if you do the, you know, uh, uh, delta E delta T uh, uh, shot noise limit, okay? Then for, for EDM experiment, you get something like uh, one over E times alpha, which is the polarization. E is the electric field strength. T is the pre-precession time. And square root of N is the number of detected neutrons you have, okay? That's the you know, Poisson statistics part. Uh, then you see that this kind of this kind of figure of merit uh, uh, for this experiment will give you a rough idea how well your experiment is doing. If you look at the electric field that we can have in superfluid helium four, is about seventy five kilovolts per centimeters. Whereas if I did something at room temperature in vacuum, it's only ten kilovolts per centimeter. Just your breakdown, uh, and yeah. So so this is a huge gain in sensitivity. Uh, if I did the polarization, the UCN and helium-3 polarization is 98%. And in the mo other modern experiments, I think, as Philip mentioned, about 80% or so. So there's you know, a little gain here. The other big gain is the free precession time. With these cryogenic cells, we can hold neutrons for about 1,000 seconds. So we, that's, that's how long we are running our free precession time for, 1,000 seconds. And typically, you're talking about 100 to 200 seconds of free precession time. So another big gain there. And the number of detected neutrons, you know, we, we have half a million or so. It turns out in the kind of new gen generation experiments, it's also about half a million. But the way they achieve this is through a very large cell, uh, about 20 liters, okay? Ours is three liters. And so there's actually, a, a, it's, for systematics, it's better to have a high density in a small cell, okay? You can imagine if you have a large cell, your magnetic field shielding and gradients, it's more difficult, right? I can do it for a very small region, but more difficult in a large region. So the main systematic, as I mentioned, is this false EDM effect where uh, a co-magnetometer, although, although the EDM of a co-magnetometer can suppress by shift screening, it can experience a false EDM. This comes from an interaction between the E cross V field and magnetic field gradients. And sometimes it's called the geometric chip. Oh, it's about it wrong. Geometric phase induced false EDM. Okay. This was discovered or kind of read as well known to a, a, AMO physicists, but it was discovered for our field in 2004 by the late and great uh, Mike Penderbury. Uh, you know, uh, kind of for a cylindrical, so a cylindrical cell, but the general relationship is that your false EDM depends on the field, magnetic field gradients depends on the dimension, the largest dimension, this is the radius, but the largest dimensions of your cell squared, okay? And you see why a smaller cell uh, is advantageous now. Uh, yeah, in terms of those two factors. And also depends on the, uh, for your co-magnetometer, the collision frequency. So remember UCNs uh, uh, kind of go in ballistic trajectory from wall to wall. But if you have a co-magnetometer, it's normally atomic species, you have a lot of uh, scattering. Uh, and so it has a mean free path. And this uh, false EDM is also dependent on the mean free path. So a very important way to study this key important systematic is to be able to vary the mean free path of your co-magnetometer uh, in your system. And so it turns out with the helium-3 phonon scattering, the mean free path changes by, uh, that's seven point, to the power of 7.5 of temperature, okay? You saw that power of seven, for the ultra cold neutron upscattering, this is a similar thing for the UCNs because the phonon density depends on the temperature of the seventh power. Uh, so you get more scattering. And so through some numerical calculations and we're, we're still tuning in on this,
but um, by scanning the temperature by very tiny amounts, so it's on the order of 0.1 Kelvin, which doesn't affect anything else, uh, you, can, you can actually change the false EDM of the helium-3. And in fact, at some ideal value, you can get it to be zero, okay? So you can suppress that. So this is you know, one of the key things for systematic controls in our experiment. There are two measurement modes. Uh, uh, okay, and this is another uh, stopping point. I'm gonna get, take a sip of water if anyone has questions so far. Florian. Oh, Florian. Oh, how do I? Hello, Florian. Hey, Ken, can you yeah. hear me? Yeah, I can hey. hear you. Uh, fine, nice to see you. Nice um, to see you too. For detecting the the betas, right? Uh, the scintillation uh, for the well, the beta, the beta decays. I'm wanted the, for the neutron helium three capture. Yeah, for the neutron helium three. So how does this work? It seems like there's this uh, somehow in the electrodes, or, or I mean, how does this technically work? I, I don't quite uh, get it. I do have a slide on it, a backup slide on it. But if you get scintillation light, which is at eighty nanometers. We do have a fluorescent coating on the wall of the cell, which converts the 80 nanometers to blue, uh, you know, 400 nanometers. So then this blue light can go through the acrylic wall. Uh, yes. This electrode is also optically transparent to uh, a, a, a light, blue light. Okay, so then that blue light goes through and hits these uh, optical fibers here, okay? And these okay, are so, the, so, so this the electrode is then uh, coated with copper. I thought just a thin layer of copper, and this lets uh, through light. Or this is uh, in, in flux, but it is not coated. It's it's actually um, a copper. Sorry, copper implanted. Okay, so copper it's a very implanted. weak ah, okay. beam, and so it's still transparent. Uh, and you know, we you have to tune that uh, implantation density. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's why the light can go through. Okay, this is what yeah, I didn't this... quite got. Okay, but, thanks. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and Skylar, I see a hand up there. Yeah, hey, Kent. Uh, maybe you said it and I missed it, but I, I wasn't clear if this 1,000 seconds that you referred to as a spin precession time is the inverse partial decay rate for depolarization, or if this is actually the holding time in your experiment. Oh, so that's the whole time. So that's about two and a half uh, inverse. Okay, so this Fair is enough, yeah. going from Uncosted. a six hundred second holding yeah. lifetime. You, okay, perfect. So Thanks. this, but the you know the storage time, if it's just wall loss and beta decay, is six hundred seconds. But then we also add the helium three plus the five hundred second time constant. So actually, the you know we have to do that for for the uh, spin analysis, and so that's that add, ends up being uh, uh, three four hundred seconds, and then oh sorry, one thousand seconds. Then is two and a half. Uh, Two and a half times four hundred seconds. Yeah, which okay, is perfect. Optical uh, optimum statistically. Okay. Thanks. Good. Gave me a chance to drink some water. Okay. So the two measurement modes that we have in EDM, I might have to go a little bit faster. Is we have what's called the double free precession mode. So you have your two species, you apply a pi over two pulse, and both species now is precessing in the transverse plane. So then you can imagine the time evolution of the angular difference, the, the angle be difference between them just goes as uh, the difference in the gyro mag difference in magnetic moments plus some EDM of the neutron that shifts it. Uh, we choose to use a 30 milligauss field. And so the precession frequency of each species is around 100 Hertz. Uh, the difference between the two species is around 10 Hertz. Okay, so this is some beating kind of beating frequency. Uh, the transverse spin coherence time, which due to some reasons, uh, you know, loss of coherence is about 10,000 seconds. So much longer than our pre-possession time. So we don't care about that so much. Uh, and, you know, and, our, and uh, the, the, the flipping frequency of the uh, E-field, we want to do something like, you know, some random sequence essentially, or not random, but some non, just, you don't want to do plus minus plus minus, because then you get other systematics. So the field, people in this asymmetry field know how to do these com more complicated sequences to suppress drifts. Uh, uh. So in the pre-precession signal, what you expect, you know, is that, you know, the, the rate of accepted scintillation light events is depends on the number of neutrons in the cell. 
You always have this beta decay uh, event, which also gets picked up by your light collection system. Uh, but you, you do cuts so that this is reduced to about 0.30% or so, okay? Uh, that's the best we can do, actually. It's, it's, this is optimized. Uh, you get, you have, you, then you want to accept the neutron helium-3 capture to about 93%. Uh, and then you get, this is this uh, 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 angle between the two spins determining the capture rate. We have, there's also some background light uh, that you can't avoid. Okay, it could be time dependent. Uh, the number of UCNs in the cell uh, depends on how well you store them. And so the, you have to integrate over the spectrum of UCNs. It turns out the UCN storage time is dependent on the kinetic energy. They reflect off the walls at different rates, et cetera. So you integrate all this. Uh, you also get a term which is the number of UCNs depends on the oscillating absorption from, from, the, from the helium-3. So we've done, we, we, you know, in the process, we're getting very good at doing these detailed simulations. And so this is the signal you get of the scintillation light. Uh, you know, the polarization is decreased, the contrast is decreasing. Uh, the number of UCNs is not on average decreasing. Uh, if you zoom in to very short time scales, this is the oscillations that you see, okay? The 10 Hertz oscillations, uh, which is the, you know, beating frequency between the two species. So now I argue, if you see this, signal, we're now, you know, what we're doing is continuously measuring the UCN phase relative to the helium-3. So I argue now this is, now we're in a continuous frequency measurement mode, okay? If you know the phase, you have to do a time derivative, you get the frequency, okay? So now this satisfies all those measure frequency uh, advantages. Um, so what we've done with these codes is we've re repeated generation and fit, and then we've determined uh, with some, ideal conditions, we're adding more complexity to this, but the ideal conditions with 300 live days of running, so you expect this to take three years, so 100 days per year, the accelerator goes down, we need maintenance and all that, okay. We get a one sigma uh, precision in the neutron EDM of three times 10 to the minus 28, which we published in a GINS paper for, for our apparatus, okay. That's the free precession mode. We also have another different, uh, another mode called the dress spin mode where again, you apply a pi over two pulse. But in this case, you apply a very strong, uh, a strong field in the transverse plane, which alters the effective precession frequencies of both species, okay? So this is uh, Cohen to uh, you know, this is the four Hamiltonian. It's called dressing because it's a quantum field. Uh, and so you're constantly exchanging photons with, with the strong, uh, strong field. Uh, and then in the limit where the dressing field is much greater than the B naught, which is the regime we operate in, the effective gyromagnetic ratio or the effective magnetic moment uh, is modified by the zero order Bezier function, which is dependent on what we call the dressing parameter, which is the amplitude of the dressing field divided by the frequency of the dressing field, okay? So what that means is, oh, some of the fonts got messed up. Uh, this is meant to be the, the change in the, New, the blue line is a change in the relative change of the neutron magnet, gyromagnetic ratio as a function of the dressing field, uh, amplitude divided by the frequency. You see, as you change this parameter, you change the neutrons. Red line is the helium-3 relative change to the neutrons, okay? Uh, and then you see at some stage the crossover, and so you can make the two species process at the same effective frequency. And so, I, so it turns out we want one, one Gauss field and 2.5 kilohertz. Uh, the other thing is, if you, this is what we call the critical condition. So if you're slightly below above this, you can make the neutron process faster and slower than the helium-3 is needed, okay? I'm gonna go through this in the quicker setting. But basically, by doing this mode, we, we sit on two angles that we alternate between the two and uh, you can extract the neutron EDM that way as a kind of asymmetry with the neutron spin at this position versus that position. And with this mode, you're actually slightly more efficient. You're not losing UCNs to unwanted absorption. And so we get a 1.7 times 10 to the minus 28 centimeters in the precision of same 300 live days in this mode, okay? Okay, so then this is, a, you feel free to read about this, but in the data analysis package that I lead, We've gone through and essentially just adding a lot of realistic effects to try to uh, understand all our systematics uh, that are involved. And one of them, you know, since we have a new type of signal, one of the key things that we've kind of really landed in the last six months or year 
is simultaneously fitting the squid signal and the scintillation light signal uh, in some global likelihood parameter. And, uh, and so this is kind of a different analysis mode, uh, but lots of other progress there. Okay, so now onto the last section of my talk, so I could wrap up pretty quick. So any questions on that? I'll get a sip of water. Yes, Bob. Yes. I was wondering, um, systematic effects there in the in the first version, you, you, you have two, well, the neutron switch process and the helium three bit process, and, and you, you assume to have a field of some femto Teslas, which you can detect, which are produced by the macroscopic um, spin polarization of the helium three, yes. and it will lead to a Rabi Bloch similar chip. So you will get spin flipping or, or spin additional spin um, um, accumulation of a phase. So, yes. so how do you deal with all that? Uh, so it turns out that uh, block C gets shift due to the oscillating field is uh, very small. So I think it shifts in, in uh, kind of uh, nanohertz or so, right? Because that shift, the block C gets shift is highly suppressed. But yeah, that's, that's yeah. But it's a fem. You're measuring on nanohertz here. Yes. Okay. So, uh, the, it, well, there are two. Th well, there are two things. So first, it cancels out to the first order of the, of the double cells, of course. Uh, but yes, uh, I, I have to dig. Maybe I'm thinking of the pseudo magnetic field. Then that's on the order. Of, I know that's a different one. I know what you're saying with the. But I think if you do a femto Tesla field, remember, you know, the 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 the, the tip. The typical tipping, for instance, the tipping pulse fields, we're using less than a milli gap, less than a micro. So in terms of Tesla, I can look into it, but I don't think it's a big effect. Like yeah, 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 yeah. I, 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 I understand the fact you're saying the healing three field. But yeah, I, you know, we can just plug in, you know, Fanta Tesla uh, rotating at that field. But yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, you should. Yeah, I will. Okay. Yes, but that yeah, that's a block C good shift. Yeah, I agree. Skylar. Ah, yes. That's average, yeah, over 300. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yes, but if you cancel that to the first order, right? Okay. And you, we only care about then you have all the, you know. And then you have the density differences and... and I, I'll, 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 I have a slide on that, yes. But yeah, the you mean the gravitational. Yeah, yeah, and, and you probably have... It. Oh, you want, some transverse, you want to add some transverse to that? Yeah, okay. Yes, I, I hear you. Yeah, okay. It's getting complicated if you do really. Mm -hmm. We haven't, we haven't included, we're working on including the pseudo magnetic field first. Yeah. But yes, uh, I hear you. Okay. Yes, that's a valid point. Mm -hmm. We should add that to our spin tracking. So we'll add that to this long list we have here. Okay. All right. So in the last section, I actually, I know I do have some photos of hardware. Um, I did, you know, mention in the title where I want to talk about alternative physics with this experiment, and I, I see there's a good talk on axions. So again, this is this is not my original idea. Okay, this is led by PSI group that you know axion light particles that couple the gluons and the neutron can produce a kind of oscillating neutron EDM signal. All right, where the amplitude of the oscillation uh, is, is given by this parameter that's related to the coupling constant. Uh, the oscillation frequency is dependent on the mass on the axion, and you assume the axion field is coherently oscillates because it was generated in the early universe. And you also assume all the local dark matter and energy densities due to this axion field. So then it lets you set limits on the axion mass. Uh, what you notice in a lot of these experiments, well, same for us to say right now, is that the highest frequency that you can probe is around three millihertz. And that's because the cycle time of these experiments is around 300, 300 seconds, right? So you get, you get this sensitivity cliff or wall when you get to low frequencies. So, you know, the sensitivity using this mode of search is scales proportionally to the EDM sensitivity. And so we can do two orders of magnitude better. Oh, I hope this doesn't, ah, oh, that's better, okay. Uh, so then we can get in this range two orders of magnitude better as well. So this is a, a mess. This uh, did not work. One new mode that we can do is if the phi of the phase now 
now we, we're able to monitor the phase within a cycle, okay? Right, so then we get oscillation or, or modulations of the precession frequency caused by the uh, axions. We can actually search up to one hertz, okay? Typical kind of cycle. Also, that's the spin, sorry, that's spin dress mode, we can search to one hertz. And then the other mode, we can switch, switch to that 10 hertz. So if I do the exclusion plot, sorry, you get, uh, so these are from simulations, some of the colors didn't work, but then the expected uh, simulation, uh, from my simulations, the, the exclusion plot is, we're able to extend into this category, uh, this frequency of about 10 Hertz here, okay? And so this is a region which is not accessed by neutron EDM experiments. And of course, we also go down just due to improve sensitivity of our experiment. And I do put in the value, the, the exclusion plot from uh, Eric Connell's group, uh, Jilla, and they, they highlighted, they were able to search over seven orders of magnitude and axion mass. And so, you know, we could probably do a couple of orders of magnitude wider than that. So that, that's another uh, search we can do with our apparatus. And another alternative physics we can do is measuring and improving the neutron magnetic moments precision. So, so there's only been, you know, this is a fundamental quantity, right? The magnetic moment of the neutron. It's only improved marginally over five decades. The original experiment, uh, the experiment back in 1979 was from Jeff Green, who's well known in the field, and Ramsey. They got 0.2 ppm. Uh, uh, PSI group improved this to 0.19 ppm. So I call it marginal, but not much improvement. So it turns out in our apparatus, what we can measure is the ratio of the neutron and helium-3 magnetic moments. Uh, what's nice is the helium-3 magnetic moment from code data is very well known to sub, you know, one part per, uh, ten, 10 parts per trillion, right? Sorry, uh, billion, sorry, 10 parts per billion. And so with one week or 11 days of data, we can get this to plus or minus 0 0.01 ppm. For three years, this goes another order of magnitude. But the key systematic effect is this uh, gravitational offset effect, okay? Because now we're trying to determine the absolute ratio of the neutron precession of the helium-3, and we're not canceling it with any subtraction between the two cells. And so we've gone through as, uh, the effort I'm leading. We really need to understand this effect. And this depends on the ultra cold neutron spectrum, okay? The high energy, the UCNs are the less they sag. Uh, one key thing that we found, so, you know, a bunch of simulations is that we have a new handle of this effect because the neutron sag evolves with time because the UCN spectrum also changes with time. And we are able to monitor the precession frequency within the 1000 seconds. So this shift, this change is constantly changing with time. So what that means is that if we apply a vertical gradient, much like in other groups, but we can now observe the time behavior and know the trajectory of this shift and really control for it as well, okay? So, so we do this uh, uh, and maybe add some magnetometry. I believe we can improve the neutron magnetic moment by about an order of magnitude, two orders of magnitude statistics, but you know, I give one up for systematics, okay? So I, I've got three minutes left. I'm just gonna go through some Hardware, uh, the, the, the technical challenges is if you look at the central detector system, we have AC fields, but A, we need very non-magnetic materials, which is even stainless steel or something is too magnetic for us. So we use a lot of plastics and composite materials. Mostly it has to be non-electrically conductive. Otherwise it messes with our AC fields. Uh, uh, however, for the electrodes as hinted earlier, we still, of course, we need that to be slightly conductive. And so we do stuff like copper, copper ion implantation to tune the conductivity of a surface. Uh, everything has to be neutron activation friendly and cryogenic. So this is, you know, the technical challenges. It's hard to build cryogenics with plastics, okay? <laughs> you want things to be strong and robust. And so, yeah, this is the last two minutes. Uh, 2012, 2018, we went through a kind of component critical component demonstration phase. And since 2018, unfortunately due to COVID, there's some delays, but we've moved on to large scale integration phase, which means we're trying to install the components at, at the spallation neutron source. So this is the, mag, the magnet module. This is just eye candy uh, 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 at Caltech, which has now been shipped to Oak Ridge. This is a you know, big ultra vacuum vessel. 
we have a magnetic shield enclosure built by a Swiss company. I guess we could maybe ski there. Oh, can we ski there? I don't know in the winter. But uh, this is our magnetic shield house, you know, multi story that's being built and it's going to be shipped to us in the next year or so. Uh, the, we are low temperatures, so we need dilution refrigerators. So this is a dilution, one of the dilution refrigerators built at University of Illinois at Urbana Champaign, and they have all the pumping stacks, which then will be moved to Oak Ridge. We have the high voltage system testing, uh, prototype testing at Los Alamos, uh, uh, atomic beam source uh, at MIT that's you know undergoing final tests. They do need to convert this to a vertical configuration, so that's some engineering that they have to undergo. And we also have a kind of a systematics and operational studies, kind of a little mini EDM apparatus at NC State. And so uh, one of the biggest, actually this week we have a big DOE review where, uh, so currently we only have external building one due to rising construction costs that blew our budgets a little bit. And so we're trying to get the funding to, 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 we need to do, build a new building. But in EB1, we're definitely um, uh, living in there now. Okay, so that, that was the big photo from last week. So summary. So I'm gonna say in summary, I think our scheme offers many advantages to reach the 10 to the minus 28 e centimeters regime. We can produce small cells of very high densities and long storage times. Uh, we can support a high, large electric fields. We can have squids and superconducting magnetic shielding because it's naturally cryogenic and that offers a lot of systematics improvements including changing the uh, uh, amine free path of our helium three code magnetometer, which is very important for studying systematics. We have, another thing is we have two different measurement modes, which were very different systematics. Uh, so, you know, we're gonna be the first experiment to get to the 10 minus 28. So if we, did, if we discover something, we need to be able to self-check our results. So having this is a kind of a huge uh, advantage uh, for us. I argued that the measurement is a true frequency measurement. Uh, however, this is a new type of signal in the field. So we're gonna uh, extensive work to understand how to analyze it. Um, and I've talked about yielding ultra, cold, uh, ultra short time baseline axion field to high mass, which is kind of interesting to me. Uh, and finally, uh, our large scale experiment is being constructed and moving to the floor at SNS. So hopefully maybe in a couple of years, we will make the local newspaper. And it's kind of you know, nice, the first experiment was at Oak Ridge and now we're coming back to this, okay? We're going back to the source. Slightly different, SNS didn't exist then, but we're coming back to the original site. And that's, um, that's my final slide. Well, Ken, thanks so much for the uh, great presentation. So uh, we are running out of time. Maybe we can we can have one quick question if you want. But okay, uh, Skylar, please go ahead. Just to mention that at four thirty we're going to have a discussion uh, okay. here. So you can, I mean, please collect all your questions. I mean, comments, and we can discuss them. I mean, further in uh, in the discussion uh, at four thirty. So Skylar, please. Yes, Skylar. Yeah, so I, I was actually just clapping, but there's something I've always been wondering, which is how you intend to deal with shape shifts from these rectangular measurement cells. So most EDM experiments exploit a cylindrical or even spherical symmetry. And I wonder if at these high levels of sensitivity, you yeah, may have to worry about this more. Are you, are you, yeah, I think it's, are you specifically referring to when you shift the electric field? I know that uh, the Actually, mercury. I, I was thinking of magnetic effects. The magnet. The pulse shape. Oh, sorry, I thought you mean physical shape of the cell. Which, which yes, I yes. No, no. F physical shape of the cell leads to non-uniform magnetization density inside, and so you'll sample your magnetic field gradients again yeah. differently. Yeah. Uh, if I, if I'm honest, that this is still how the cell is going to be attached to the electric, you know, which determines how. The, the shape shifting is uh, not, we're still going through that because we don't have the final electrodes yet. So that's still an ongoing kind of engineering uh, challenge. But I know, yeah, for the Mercury EDM, you know, uh, changing sh sh shifting of the cell that didn't matter. And so, yes, that's, yeah, I, I don't have a, I, I, I can't tell you a conclusion from that. Okay, so thanks, Ken. Maybe yeah. we move to our next yeah, speaker. So thanks a lot.